Okay, here we go. Um, Melanie, do you want to share your screen, please? Yes, so I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Excellent. Is yes, it working? Right. We can. So it's my a great pleasure to uh, introduce our first speaker, Melanie Guitar from uh, Paris School of Economics, presenting a paper on mining and water pollution in Africa. Melanie, you have uh, 15 minutes, and I'll give you a five minute warning towards the end. Okay, thank you very much, Niklas, for the introduction. And I want to thank first the CSA to give me the opportunity for presenting this paper. So I am a for, so the paper is co-authored with uh, Irene Hu, and we are two uh, both uh, PhD students at the Paris School of Economics. So me, I'm in uh, my fourth year of PhD, uh, both at the PSC and also at the CIA, so I'm towards the end of my PhD. And I'm going to uh, present you a chapter of uh, this uh, PhD uh, about industrial mining, water pollution, and child health in Africa. So industrial local the extraction of natural resources can be a potential for industrial development, for local development, but also can generate negative externalities. Uh, so indeed, the opening of an industrial mine can have multifold effects. Uh, this is the trade-off of industrial mining, as it can generate positive externalities. Uh, for example, through, through a market channel, it can uh, generate or increase the demand for local labor uh, and uh, can uh, raise the access to uh, goods and services. And through a fiscal uh, channel, uh, if taxation increases, for example, it can increase the spending for public uh, spendings and improve the access to facilities and health services, for example. However, industrial mining can also generate negative externality by creating uh, cost opportunities that can tr trigger conflicts and corruption, can also um, uh, trigger massive uh, migration wave and uh, displacement of the uh, labor population, but also can uh, increase the exposure to air and water pollution. So this is the ambiguous effect of industrial mining activity. Uh, and this paper mainly focused on the effects on local population health. And the research questions are twofold. First, we uh, intend to assess the magnitude of the effect of uh, industrial mining activity on infant mortality overall Africa. And the second main contribution would be to uh, try to find the evidence of a mechanism of interest, which is the pollution, the water pollution linked to industrial mining activity in Africa and its effect on local population's health. So a quick uh, review of uh, literature on uh, this ambiguous effect of industrial mining activity. So there is a huge debate on that. Uh, depending, of course, on the outcome of the papers. So, for example, looking at uh, the effects on living standards, MAMO and all overall Africa, so for 42 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, finds that being near an industrial site can increase night lights. However, however doesn't does not see any effects on household wealth and also identify a degradation of sewage treatment systems. In uh, Ghana, Aragon and Road show that industrial mining activity can decrease agriculture agricultural total factor productivity, and they mainly explain that through a hair pollution channel. So other paper identified the natural resource curse of uh, industrial mining activity, such, I, such as the paper, this mine is by, by uh, Berman and Coutonnier here, which show that uh, mining activity creates opportunity costs that trigger conflict. Um, or the paper of Basili and Girard that focus in Burkina Faso uh, on the local uh, defect and local consumption of both artisanal and industrial mining activity and show that actually only artisanal gold mining increase local consumption and not industrial mining activity. However, this paper focused mainly on health and there is debate in the literature about the negative or positive effect of industrial mining activity on local health. So, for example, the paper of Tolonen look at eight uh, sub-Saharan African countries and show that being near an industrial mine, um, so within 10 kilometers of a site, a mining site, decrease actually infant mortality rates uh, during the activity phase, the production activity phase of the mining site. However, 
So looking in all developing countries, Van der Goltz and Van Weyl using the same kind of treatment, which is a proxy uh, using the distance to the mining site as a proxy for exposure to industrial and activity, finds actually that being near, so within five kilometers of a mining site can uh, increase asset wealth. However, increase also anemia among women and find a negative effects as it finds stunting in young children living near the industrial mine. So we can see here the uh, ambiguous effect of industrial activity on local health. And uh, this is the kind of contribution of this paper here is to understand the ambiguity of the effects on children mortality in overall Africa, so in Sub-Saharan Africa, and capture the effect uh, of mining pollution and water sources on health. So here for the data that uh, we are using in this paper, so the mining data is the SNL Mining and Metals Database, which is uh, the most uh, database used in the literature. So it's not an uh, exhaustive database on mining sites in Africa. Overall, it's the most exhaustive database that we can find, and it's a data that is privately uh, owned. So it gives a panel of mine, uh, mining sites, uh, giving information about the production of the mine, the uh, geocoded information, the commodity type, uh, the dates of opening and closure of the mining sites. Overall, in Africa, we have three, uh, so 3,000 uh, industrial mines, uh, so 4,800 uh, mines, and uh, 2,500 that uh, we uh, matches with DHS cluster, because we're using DHS, so it means uh, 2,500 mines that are within 100 kilometers of a DHS cluster. So for the moment, so the results that we're going to present you in this presentation uh, are based on the preliminary, preliminary subsample of 100 mines. Uh, so for that, we took 600 mines from the SNL database that give us information about the start and the closure years of the mines. And we unchecked so far 200 mines, uh, so for the start and the closure years, using mostly aerial images and archive and other information that we find from uh, mine history and basically reports from the mine history. So, so far we have finished the uh, end work uh, process where we uh, checked for uh, 1,600 mines uh, using the same process, uh, using aerial images and archive information. However, we do not have the results for the overall sample and we are going to present you the result for this preliminary, preliminary subsample. So for the socioeconomic uh, database, we're using the DHS. Uh, so all the DHS waves uh, in Africa for, um, from 1986 to 2018 for 36 uh, African countries, which had uh, repeated uh, cross-sectional surveys. And the outcome of interest will be infantile mortality rates, so under 12, under 24, and under 36 um, months mortality. So just a remark, we just focused on the uh, survey on uh, children under five uh, years old, and we do not use the retrospective questions of the natality of the women, and this is just to avoid a uh, bias of migration. So here uh, you can see just a map of Africa and the special variation of uh, mortality rates, but also in uh, yellow, the mining industry, the industrial mining side of our uh, preliminary subsample. Here you, we present you, so overall here for all the mines and here are for the mines that we are crossed with the DHS cluster. So here is the temporal variation of the mining activity. And here in red and blue, so in red is the temporal variation of mining, uh, of opening of a mining site and closure of mining site. So here you can see that we have a high temporal variation of opening of mining site overall Africa. And here it just, um, a graph here that shows you for each country the number of uh, all open mines that we use for our uh, analysis. And here it's just the temporal variation. So for each country, we look at the variation of uh, the opening of mines between the first and the last wave of DHS. So here you can see that in uh, Zimbabwe, for Ghana, and also Senegal, we have a lot of uh, mine. It's not a flow, it's just a stock. And for the flow of opening mines, we can see that uh, Guinea is not uh, the main uh, recipient of mines. It has a high variation in time of mining opening. 
So, and for uh, the uh, analysis that allow us to look at um, indirectly to water pollution, we use a sub basin uh, data set from Hydrochet that gives us a fashtator classification, uh, giving information, location information, whether a sub basin uh, upstream or downstream. And it's a relative position according to uh, the other sub basins. So here in this analysis, we propose two main empirical strategies to compare the effect, first the overall effect, and secondly, um, indirectly give evidence of a water pollution channel. So here is a, a scheme for the first empirical strategy that relies on what is done in the literature. So where we proxy exposure to mining site uh, with distance. So it's called the geographic treatment in our paper. So here we compare the uh, Elf, uh, so the infantile mortality rate of individuals living from zero to 10 kilometers to those living 10 to 100 kilometers to a mining site. And we compare it before and after the opening of a site. So this is a defensive, a basic uh, defensive. And we compare this analysis to the second empirical strategy here, uh, where instead of comparing uh, the outcome of ind individual living near a mine versus living a little more further, we compare the uh, health uh, outcomes of individual living upstream versus downstream the industrial mine before and after its opening. So this is here that uh, thanks to this empirical strategy, we can find an indirect evidence of water pollution or health uh, or not based on our result that we will give you right away. So here is uh, just the uh, econometric uh, equation of the first uh, um, empirical analysis where we proxy exposure to mining site to a uh, distance. So we uh, interact uh, demi, uh, whether the mining site is open at the birth year of the child, uh, interacted to another demi, whether the child lives from zero to 10 kilometers or uh, 10 to 100 kilometers of the closest mine. And uh, it's a two-way fixed effect as uh, we uh, use a district fixed effect, a district first year trend fixed effect and cross-street first year fixed effect. You have about four and a half minutes. Thank you. So here is the second uh, econometric analysis for the second treatment, where instead of interacting uh, the fact that the mine is opened with the distance, uh, so we interact that according to the topographic uh, position of the individual, whether he lives upstream or downstream the mine. And here on this picture, we just show you so the uh, hydroshed uh, data set that classify the position of each sub -basin. So for example, here in yellow, you can see the industrial mining site and in round, you can see the DHS cluster. And in red is the sub -basin that is downstream of the sub -basin of the mine. And here the sub -basin which is upstream the sub -basin of the mine. So here is the main results for the first analysis where we can see actually, so for here is for the um, different types of uh, infantile mortality under 12, under 24, and under 46. And we can see that living within 10 kilo kilometers of an open industrial mining site increased, decreased sorry, the mortality rates uh, by 1.4 percentage point, which is in line with a result from uh, uh, Tolonen, uh, where she saw for eight uh, sub saharan countries and decrease of uh, mortality rate as well. So here we have, uh, in terms of magnitude, a 22% reduction. And it's um, mostly statistically significant, but is no longer statistically uh, significant for uh, the other 24 and 46 mortality. Here we also can see that it is not stable when we control for immigrant. And actually, this is explained by the fact that when we do, again, the regression mainly for migrants, for immigrants, we can see that uh, here we have a huge effect, uh, which might be explained that our results might be uh, suggestive of a selection of the immigrants uh, when we look at that. And here is the result when uh, we use the second empirical strategy based on the topographic uh, treatment. And here on the contrary, we do not see any effect of a defensive for the under 12 months mortality. However, for the under 24 and 46 mortality, we see an increase of the mortality rates. And here, for instance, an increase by seven percentage point, which means that it doubles the mortality. So it means that living downstream an open mine increase the mortality rates for under 24 mortality by two. So here, the contribution as a conclusion of this uh, paper. So here, just 
something. It's just that uh, this suggests that if we do not see any uh, result on inf under 12 year uh, mortality, this suggests that water pollution can have maybe more time uh, to uh, impact the child. Uh, but this is just a suggestive evidence of that, and which will uh, conduct an event study analysis to see the delay in uh, the effect on mortality according to the topographic and geographic treatment. So here to conclude the contribution of this paper. So we saw the uh, reduction in infantile mortality rate when we uh, when exposure to mining activity is proxied by distance, which is in line with the literature. However, when uh, we uh, take into account the upstream and downstream position of villages, we see on the contrary an increase of infant mortality rates, and uh, this result tempers the positive effect that uh, we found in the literature and is an indirect evidence of water pollution linked to industrial mining sites. And as next steps uh, to this analysis, so first, we need to find the results when we include the rest of the unchecked mill, which will more than double our uh, sample of mines. Um, we will conduct an event study, uh, as I explained to you uh, before, and an heterogeneity analysis according to the mineral type and the drinking water source. Um, and we will test, for example, for the Duchesse Martin and the 12 uh, estimator. So I thank you for your attention, and uh, I uh, am available, of course, for discussion. And thank you again. Thank you very much, Melanie, for a super interesting uh, presentation. Um, now, in the interest of time, let's move straight on. So, Omoni, if you uh, may want to share your screen once Melanie has stopped. Um, our next speaker is uh, Omoni Alimi um, from the University of Waikato. Um, Olomini, I yeah, we can see your slides. You have 15 minutes. I'll give you a warning after 10. Thank you very much. Um, uh, welcome to um, my session, which will be talking about uh, the impact of gas flaring on child health in Nigeria. Uh, so this is joint work with uh, Professor John Gibson from uh, University of Waikato. Uh, so gas flaring, the burning of uh, gas coming out of oil wells is a common practice in oil producing developing countries. This is uh, a very economically wasteful and environmental damaging process. Uh, it, it's probably one of uh, uh, the many uh, uh, way, uh, ways in which pollution is uh, uh, released in uh, oil production process, and it's harmful to human health due to a lot of uh, pollutants that are released. So we've got a long list of pollution due to gas flaring, including uh, carbon monoxide and carbon dioxide. And these pollutants can also travel over long distances due to the height in which uh, flaring take place. Uh, the flaring is especially common in Nigeria, especially in the Niger Delta, where most of the oil pollution takes place. And about 10% of all the gas uh, produced in Nigeria is flared. And close to 2 million people in the Niger Delta live within four kilometers of a flare site. So to put some context into this, uh, on my right here is uh, a, a flare site, and we can see a village uh, very close to it. And the issue is, is very topical, and it's been covered in the news a lot. Um, this is a CNN um, article about uh, the Nigerian uh, oil, oil capital, Potapot, and uh, it's covered in, in strange black suit. So um, there is a, um, an understanding of the effect of flaring in, in Nigeria but most of the existing focus is on the lost revenue aspect. So PwC estimated that in 2018 alone, $761 million is sort of the lost revenue from flaring in a country which is uh, suffering from a uh, uh, budget shortage. You can see that this, is, this represents a, a significant amount of money. And uh, the continuous use of flaring represents uh, limited progress in uh, commercializing the use of gas and uh, limited technological improvements in, in oil production. Uh, the government has been trying to do something about this. In 2017 and 2018, they approved the National Gas Policy and Gas uh, Flaring Prohibition Bill, which increased the penalty for, for flaring, so increased the penalty by 80-fold. Um, we estimate that based on our 2018 flare volumes, if there was full compliance with this uh, new law, they would generate about 642 million in fines compared to the $8 million from the old regulatory regime, which was uh, very, very lenient. But what is uh, really ignored in this discussion is the health effects. And this is uh, this especially has potential 
uh, long-term effects. And why this has not been studied to date is uh, due to the doubt about uh, official data on flaring. So most of these are self-reported by the uh, oil production and also an incentive to, to misreport, especially with this new law uh, coming into place that increases penalty for flaring. And also there is uh, a lack of a type of uh, comprehensive database uh, linking health, uh, providing health data, which we might use to uh, sort of perform this analysis. So what we aim to do in this uh, research is to bridge some of these gaps, especially on the, on the data side. So we use uh, georeference data on all gas flaring locations in Nigeria. These data come from satellite observations, so they're not subjective to, to manipulation like the self-reported data. And also we treat onshore and offshore flaring locations equ equivalently. Uh, so about half of our Nigeria's flaring sites are located offshore. And one, one uh, new addition in which we bring into this work is to examine uh, offshore flaring. Typically, the impact of offshore uh, gas flaring has not been observed on, on uh, local population. And the, the sites in which this uh, flaring take place are very close to places where people live. So we link this to demographic health survey data on child health. Um, child health matters, especially for, for long run impacts. And we look at things such, such as uh, anthropometric measurement of children, which can reveal uh, more about their contemporary environment rather than measuring adults who have a uh, greater buffering capacity. Uh, there is also something which is unique about our setting, uh, which is the limited scope for endogenous avoidance behavior. So in richer countries, um, there, there are uh, ways in which people could decide to, to cope with this sort of pollution, maybe by moving away. But in this setting, we see limited scope for this because of land market rigidity. So this is a very dense area. And also there is an attachment to land there due to, uh, uh, due to the ethnic divide in, this, uh, in the Niger Delta, as well as people want to be close to uh, oil and gas uh, uh, installations because of the benefits that accrue from this in terms of uh, patronage from oil companies, scholarships, etc. And we also try to illustrate the value of uh, unconventional satellite data in data poor environments such as Nigeria and the payoff to sort of real georeferenced uh, surveys uh, such as DHS. So in terms of uh, related literature, um, there is a host of uh, evidence on the negative uh, impacts of, uh, of air pollution. Uh, but get, getting like a causal effect is complicated due to confounding factors. So people may take uh, endogenous risk avoidance behaviors like uh, moving that I described. So, you know, observational data may overstate effect of pollution. Uh, pollution may attract younger, healthier immigrants, such as in oil, oil, oil workers, in which case when we use observation data again, we might underestimate the effect. Or there, should, there could be measurement error. So how do we attribute um, pollution into people? But causal evidence that tries to address some of these issues are found, you know, increased child hospitalizations, you know, effect on infant mortality, birth outcomes, and reduced uh, human capital uh, formation and outcomes as well. Uh, with respect to gas flaring and health specifically, uh, instead of broadly air pollution, uh, most of the literature has been from the US and it's been in the context of fracking, so un unconventional gas flaring. Um, we take a look at conventional gas flaring here in Nigeria, partly because of the long history of flaring in this area. And as well as we think uh, the pollution that comes from fracking might be different from the pollution that, that comes from uh, uh, conventional gas flaring. But from the literature in the US, um, there is evidence that flaring affects birth outcomes, so increased odds of preterm birth, shorter gestational period, and uh, uh, infant mortality as well. Um, there is limited existing studies uh, for Nigeria, no, no large scale examination of the impact of uh, flaring. Uh, small scale studies that are available, such as uh, Madrika and Tobin West, they look at 600 households in, in six Nigerian communities, uh, some with flaring, three without, and they found that gas flaring is associated with being hypertensive. Another study which compared uh, medical records in communities with flaring and not flaring found uh, frequent uh, diseases such as asthma, cough and uh, breathing difficulty and skin irritation in, in flaring communities. So in terms of our own data, we've got satellite observations on gas flaring location and volumes. Uh, this is from the VERSE uh, night fire satellite. Uh, uh, this, this satellite work by detecting heat emitted by gas flares. 
it has a, a very high spatial resolution, so 0 0.7 kilometers, so very accurate. And it's publicly available uh, at this website, which is um, sort of a collaboration between the uh, Nigerian government and the uh, National Atmospheric uh, uh, Agency, which gives us uh, estimates of flare volume and flare location. So we, we link this um, georeference uh, geo data on flare into to demographic and health surveys. So uh, the DHS is a very popular uh, data set uh, on, on women and children, their health outcomes, including self-reported uh, measures of uh, cough and some respiratory symptoms and other diseases, as well as it's got uh, anthropometric uh, measurements for children. So we focus on DHS clusters in the oil producing Niger Delta region of Nigeria. We include Cross River State, although Cross River has been technically deleted from, uh, uh, delisted from oil producing states in Nigeria, but it's closure to uh, it's very close to current oil producing states as well as uh, the offshore sites. So we include it in our analysis. So just to sort of uh, put some context into flaring locations and our DHS clusters. So the brown uh, sort of dots are flaring locations and the green, the light green and the deep green are DHS clusters uh, based on some uh, the photo that I showed earlier. You know, some clusters are very, very close to flare sites. So the closest a DHS cluster to, to a flare site in, in, in 2018 is about 870 meters. Um, when we look at the median distance for onshore sites, it's about 153 kilometers. If we include both onshore and offshore, this is about 181 kilometers. Um, although this might seem like distances that are far, overseas evidence have shown that uh, flaring could affect air quality up to 170 kilometers away. So we think uh, most of these DH, DHS clusters could be in areas uh, that are affected by the impact of the pollution from, from flaring. Um, we also highlight the benefit of our satellite data, which we use. Uh, official data appears to start under reporting flaring, especially uh, when uh, the new regulations came in. So we could see from the period 2012, 2015, our um, satellite data and the official data were sort of uh, uh, very, very close in estimation. But around the time when there were public hearings on the new bill, and uh, uh, as the new law came into, into force, we could see uh, evidence of uh, misreporting of flaring. And by 2018, official estimates were now 30% uh, below the satellite estimate. We think this is uh, reflecting incentives to start under-reporting flaring due to the new uh, regime, which uh, penalizes flaring more. You have about five minutes left. So what do we do? We calculate the risk of exposure to flaring um, as the inverse distance weighted average of flare volumes from each flare site. Uh, there are two advantages to this approach that we take. This does not treat each flaring site as equal. Instead, you know, it takes that into account the volume of the gas flared from each location. And it also, we, by using this method, we'll also be able to take into account offshore flaring and treat it in an equivalent way uh, to onshore flaring. And, and we established the association between flaring and, and, and child health outcomes by regressing this child health outcome variables on, on uh, our um, exposure, uh, risk of exposure variable controlling for child, parent, and household characteristics. We, we take both a child level approach and an aggregated cluster level approach. Um, some summary statistics of our child health outcomes. So we could see the incidence of cough and respiratory diseases here, about 17%. Um, our anthropometric uh, characteristics, you know, stunting, wasting, and underweight, as well as the rate of uh, infant and child mortality um, in this region. So what do we find in terms of our results? We find significant positive associations between uh, flaring and community-wide rates of uh, cough and respiratory in-house fever, as well as our anthropometric measures, stunting, wasting, and underweight. Uh, these effects become uh, slightly larger once we control for household and community characteristics. In terms of magnitude, a one standard deviation higher volume of uh, gas flaring is associated with about a 0.1 uh, standard deviation higher rate of stunting, wasting, as well as uh, respiratory illness. We, don't, we do not find any association with infant or child mortality at the cluster level. Our individual results also corroborate this pattern, so the probability that a child has a cough or other respiratory issues of fever is three percentage points higher per standard deviation exposure to, to flaring. 
And uh, for underweight and being wasted, it's about one percentage point higher. So this is summarizing uh, most of our results. Uh, the only ones which we do not find statistical significance is that diarrhea for our diseases, as well as uh, uh, all our measures of mortality. The rest are, are, are about uh, 8.1 uh, standard deviation effect. So uh, what are some of the limitations of our study? So this, the Niger Delta area is one of the most polluted areas in the world. It's possible that our results, especially the, the ones looking at anthropometric uh, measures, may be picking up other form of pollution, which is happening um, in this area, such as oil spillage, which may work through the food channel. So um, crop growth, which affects or fishing, which affects um, child nutrition. In terms of next steps, we, we plan to see, uh, to examine a, a causal impact of pollution on health outcomes in this area by comparing the health outcomes of siblings born to the same mother before and after flaring. So sometimes due to, due to technical reasons or due to uh, other factors in these areas, well stop flaring for, for a long time. And this gives us an opportunity to compare outcome of siblings uh, born to the same mother before and after flaring resumes. Uh, to, to conclude, we, we find positive associations between flaring and incidences of diseases, particularly respiratory diseases and fever as well as our short-term nutritional outcomes. Our study provides the first comprehensive child health impact of flaring in the Niger Delta region, one of the regions with the highest uh, flare activity and where uh, previously there has been no uh, examination of the health impact of this uh, um, uh, flaring activities. And our methodology and design here could also be expanded to other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, such as Gabon and Congo, uh, that are like Nigeria in their uh, use of flaring, but where limited data uh, have also prevented the examination of health impacts. Uh, thank you for your time, and that's me. Thank you so much, Omonie. It's an extremely interesting uh, topic, and uh, also thank you very much for flagging the data uh, that you've been using. I may have just clicked on it, and it looks quite impressive that that, that data set. Uh, thank you very much. Now our next speaker is Potencia. So Potencia, if you may want to share your screen. Right. Okay. Yeah, here we go. It's full screen. Perfect. So it's my pleasure to introduce Potencia Hadunka uh, talking about warm infestation and charcoal production in Zambia. Potencia, you have uh, 15 minutes. I'll give you a warning after 10. All right. Thank you so much for the introduction. So um, as, as uh, the topic has been introduced, uh, so I'm trying to look at the staple crop uh, pest damage and natural resources exploitation. So this is a case of fall armyworm infestation and charcoal production in Zambia. So why should we care about this? I think it's... Yeah, so uh, deforestation, particularly in the uh, sub-Saharan Africa, has been um, increasing over time. And then this has uh, been threatening global climate change and also biodiversity. But one of the drivers that has been identified, uh, which is causing this deforestation, especially in the um, sub-Saharan Africa, has been charcoal. So usually farmers produce charcoal whenever they uh, experience income shock, which is caused by the production shock. So there are different shocks that can cause um, like agriculture to actually like really fail. So um, for, uh, in 2016, um, there's this pest called boa armyworm, which is like a native of, um, most countries in um, America. So um, it was reported in 2016, and um, it's possible that it's the biggest cause of production shock uh, in the country, which is likely to be a problem for a long time because uh, the climate in the sub-Saharan Africa is suitable for, um, for armyworm. So in this uh, study, like what, 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 what we're trying to look at, uh, we're trying to look at how this pest can possibly, like this pest shock can possibly increase charcoal production and uh, later deforestation. Then uh, we're trying to look at, uh, in, because you know, like charcoal production is one of the coping mechanisms that's used whenever uh, farmers uh, experience this shock. So we want to see in the presence of other coping mechanisms, do farmers too, um, like how do farmers 
make the decision to participate in charcoal production? Does it increase or decrease? So um, just to give you a snapshot of the results. So I, uh, we find that uh, for, uh, the four armyworm in the village increases the, prob uh, the probability of producing charcoal by 3.48%. Uh, That's like an increase from the baseline of 22%. So it increases to 26%. So all these results are robust to um, linear and uh, region-specific time trends and also instrumental variables for the presence of four armyworms. Then we also find that uh, the coping strategies such as migration and reducing uh, the maize share and uh, spraying for uh, four armyworms reduces the likelihood of farmers participate, uh, participating in uh, charcoal production. While some coping mechanisms such as off-farm labor and crop diversification actually increases this likelihood. So the contribution uh, of this study to the Board of Literature is that, uh, first of all, we're providing uh, insight on how um, deforestation can be driven by this shock, uh, like production shock from farmers. And then uh, second, uh, we are trying to also um, contribute uh, in terms of the direction of this um, debate that has been there for a long time, you know, because uh, most of the times whenever people think about like agricultural production and deforestation, it's always like, um, you know, you increase agricultural production and then uh, deforestation is going to actually increase. This is that, that uh, correlation that's always being talked about. But in this study, we're, try, we're going to show that it depends. It's not always supposed to be like you increase uh, agricultural production. It depends on the um, coping mechanisms that are available. So in this study, we also estimate this, um, estimate the impact of this negative shock uh, uh, for uh, forest mechanisms and other coping mechanisms that have done, uh, that I've mentioned. And then we're also using this uh, correlate, uh, correlated uh, random effects model. So this model, um, it accounts for an observed heterogeneity and also like nonlinear, it controls for all this in nonlinear models without causing um, incidental parameter errors. And then uh, we're also using the producer data. So this is uh, the charcoal, the actual, uh, the actual charcoal uh, data like that we did collect in the field, as opposed to just using this uh, deforestation data, which is um, commonly used by most researchers uh, by Hansen. The issue with the Hansen data is that it's not well calibrated in the sense that, you know, it does pick mostly the uh, tropical areas, but like countries like Zambia, it's not all tropical areas. So if you focus on the Hansen data, there's, there's a chance that you have this um, incidental parameter errors. So uh, the, the, the data set that I'm using for this study, it's called the Household Income Consumption and Production um, Survey, ECAPS for short. So it's at household level, and then the, I have outcome variables, so of which one of them I'm using charcoal as a binary. The other, it's just like uh, charcoal, uh, the quantities, which is a continuous variable. So I have uh, all these demographics, agricultural production variables, I have the rainfall variables from the chips, temperature from the modis, and then global forest uh, data set by the University of Maryland. And then um, we have two years of treatment. That's from 2017 to 2019. And the baseline uh, in 2016 before the four armyworms were reported. So um, for this study, obviously, because we're using a difference in differences, uh, so the assumption of the difference in differences is that uh, those people that had charcoal and those people that did not have charcoal, in terms of um, observables and, and observables, they have to balance so that the difference um, between the two groups should arise due to um, the treatment, which is the charcoal infestation. So to show that, I test using the balance table because like I don't have like uh, much data uh, before uh, the baseline, like um, I don't have data that extends before 2016. So I had to use a balance table. Then um, I also use uh, a leads test just to test that assumption. And um, I also use uh, deforestation data from the Hansen just to show, because there's a strong correlation between charcoal production and deforestation. So I'm able to use that um, deforestation data to actually show the trends. So um, looking at the baseline table, uh, looking at uh, the balance table, you can see that uh, pretty much um, the, um, the two groups are balanced uh, across 
almost all the variables. So we can say, um, so just to point out with uh, the timing of uh, charcoal production and uh, the four amurums. So usually in Zambia, like uh, planting is done in November and then the four amurums are reported um, around like January and then harvest usually happens in uh, July to August. And then the charcoal production is just before they start planting. That's between September and October. So you can see that um, around that area, this charcoal production is being driven by the need for uh, like income. If uh, the farmers have experienced a production shock in the previous year. So um, using the leads test, so you can see that um, what's causing the decision for them to actually produce uh, ch uh, charcoal is being driven by what happened in the previous year and not what's, um, what's happening, like the four IMOMs that had happening in the uh, current season. So, you know, like the lead test, the assumption it uses is that, you know, uh, the coefficients for all the leads should be zero. And we can see that from um, the, the um, the, the leads, which is the current four amurums, that's zero. And that's the reason why I'm lagging the variable throughout my analysis. So just to give you like a snapshot of um, like uh, the power trends. So you can see that around 2017, when we did have four amurums, this is like this uh, huge jump, um, which is like really suggestive that um, the deforestation around that period is being driven by uh, the shock and uh, the production shock was by four amurums. So um, I mean, uh, this is just a setup for uh, the correlated uh, random effects model um, of which the beta we're measuring the intensity of four amurum and then we're also uh, capturing um, the time invariant and observable and observe, um, and observable um, characteristics. And then we have like a bunch of these covariates that we're uh, controlling for. And then we're also controlling for the means of the time uh, varying variables. And then obviously there's uh, the idiosyncratic uh, error time. So the issue um, with this study that might arise is the issue of endogeneity. So this, this endogeneity is uh, basically caused by simultaneity. It's possible that's caused by simultaneity in the way they are um, deciding how to use these coping mechanisms. Because these coping mechanisms can be used simultaneously, right? As you're thinking about it, you can, uh, you can think uh, about using uh, crop diversification whilst still spraying for this four amur. So to control for that, I, I use um, this instrument uh, where I'm getting the variation in the coping mechanism across the agricultural camps and constructing this um, instrument. So it's just like really the average of those uh, coping mechanisms in each camp. Yeah, so this is us. Um, a quick uh, map just to show you uh, a, a correlation between um, for armyworm infestation, intensity, and charcoal production. So you can see that in these areas where um, it's kind of like dark, where the, the, uh, the shade of red is kind of like dark, you can see that because uh, these are the areas where um, the infestation for uh, the four armyworm infestation are greater. Farmers are, are actually like producing high, um, they're producing a lot of charcoal in those areas. So those areas that are hit a lot by charcoal, by four amurums, farmers are actually producing uh, charcoal. So there's this uh, huge correlation even before you actually like uh, do the regression. So- You have about five minutes left. Okay. So the whole theory of change is that uh, when farmers are hit by four amurums, uh, this, uh, and the maize, are, uh, the maize is affected, the maize is like the staple food for uh, countries like Zambia and most of the Sub-Saharan African countries. So um, they are forced to actually like produce charcoal and then this charcoal leads to uh, deforestation. So um, just as I had uh, noted in the earlier results, uh, this is what I'm finding. I'm finding that um, as the intensity is increasing in uh, charcoal, it's causing like a 3.4%. So against the baseline, so that becomes like 26% uh, increase in charcoal production, which is like a very big deal. So, um, the coping mechanism, uh, the coping strategies that are, that are available, at least uh, in Zambia at the moment, is that uh, farmers can choose to reduce the uh, maize share. So if they are affected by four, uh, four armyworms in the previous season, the way they're responding to that is reducing the uh, maize share. So because uh, four armyworms have shown a preference towards uh, attacking uh, maize, 
So the thing is that you want to reduce um, the maize share by uh, increasing uh, crop diversification. And then obviously you have to control, if you have been affected in the previous season, you want to control um, the forearming worms by spraying. And then migration is also an option where they're migrating from their carrying fields to another um, village and then off farm uh, work. So they can, uh, if they are hit by forearming worms in the previous season and they experience this shock, uh, this uh, income shock, they can uh, find uh, off farm work if it's available in their region. So um, how do those uh, coping mechanisms kind of affect uh, the decision for farmers to actually like, produce? So I'm using like uh, an interaction term here. Uh, so I'm having the variable itself and then interacting it with uh, the form. So you can see that in terms of maize share, because I'm using the inverse of it, which, which means that they am reducing the maize share. So you can see that maize share uh, does reduce, if they, they reduce the maize share, they're, um, their chances of their probability of uh, producing uh, charcoal kind of like reduces. But with crop diversification, as you might think that it should uh, reduce uh, their uh, chances of pr producing charcoal, it works in the reverse way. So this is a problem when you're having um, a crop, which is a staple crop, because if you diversify, you still need to actually still consume the same amount that you, you are consuming. So if you are hit by four armyworms and you diversify into something that's um, similar to what you are producing, you still need to, um, you still need, they still need money to buy that uh, same amount of maize that they had reduced on. So in that sense, you know, they are forced to actually like produce charcoal to actually like um, um, fill in the gap for that. And migration, obviously it does uh, reduce their likelihood uh, to produce charcoal and then off farm um, labor, it does increase. And then um, spraying, which is like really strongly shows that it does uh, reduce uh, the likelihood to actually produce charcoal. So just to conclude, uh, just in conclusion, yeah, my results do shed um, a new light in terms of the impact of a new agricultural pest because it's as new and it has been understudied so far on natural resources and the mechanism. So I'm showing the mechanism to which uh, this can lead to uh, resource, uh, resource de degradation. And then um, I think it's also very important for uh, policymakers to focus on interventions that decrease uh, maize share and uh, maize production in general. So the diversification that should be there they should think about uh, crops that are not in the same family as maize, such as cassava, but they're kind of like very similar. Because cassava is not usually attacked by four armyworm, but it can be used as a, as a good substitute for uh, maize. So uh, the policymakers should also um, help the farmers because there's been like this huge uh, concern about that, that farmers have been uh, raising that uh, they are not able to access these uh, chemical insecticides. So they should make sure that they are available because it's showing that spray does reduce at the likelihood. So um, this is basically um, it for my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Potencia. Um, a very, very interesting uh, angle here to look at deforestation due to this infestation mechanism. Our next speaker is uh, Rose Camille Vincent from uh, Zurich. Uh, Rose, if you would want to start sharing your screen and then you would have 15 minutes. Mm. Okay, Excellent. thank you for having me. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you well. Okay, perfect. So my name is Rose Vincent. I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Chair of Public Economics of ETH Zurich, and I'm happy to present this paper on mining and the quality of public services in Africa, the role of local governance and decentralization, which is a joint work with Mati Conte. So basically, um, in a nutshell, the paper investigates the effects of mining on quality of public services and optimisms about the future of individuals in Africa. We bring forward the relevance of local institutions and decentralization in mitigating the proximity to mine effects. So in terms of contribution, we hope 
to have added to the um, evidence, with the existing evidence on the local effects of mining. And we bring new evidence on the mediating role of local institutions, local fiscal arrangements, and the interplay between the two in shaping the mining effects. So we asked to research questions in this paper. First is, do individuals living near mining zones, active or inactive, have different assessments of the quality of public services and optimism about the future? And we also ask whether the quality of local institutions matter and is decentralization, and by that we mean the ability of the local governments to raise taxes and revenues in mitigating a confounding factor of the mining effect. So there has been a huge literature on whether natural resources is a curse or a blessing, especially at the macro level. The question has been extensively explored, for instance, in the, in the literature on Dutch thesis hypothesis, potential political economy and conflict channels, heterogeneous effects based on quality of institutions with um, a long list of, of um, well-cited publications. Um, the macro level literature, however, has led to inconclusive empirical evidence on whether natural resources are actually a curse or a blessing. And um, it has also been packed with uh, various like identification issues. Now, in recent years, what we've observed is that there has been an increase in focus on micro level analysis as disaggregated and local level data with geocoded information is becoming more and more available, especially at the sub -Saharan, um, in Sub-Saharan Africa or in Latin America. So this has led to growing evidence on the local effects of mining on local communities, such as local economic activity, socioeconomic indicators on education or health outcome, and also local conflict and corruption. However, what we've identified in terms of gaps is that there is a very scarce to no empirical evidence on the role of local institutions and variation in local quality of institution in the literature on um, at least the micro level uh, literature on the proximity to mine effects. Of course, there are some anecdotal evidences um, that local institution matters. So let's say within a country, if you have variations um, in terms of local quality of institution, that could be of relevance on how mining actually affects local community or nearby communities. I mean, there are several rationals for looking at local institutions and local fiscal arrangement. One of them is that since the late uh, 1990s and early 2000s, there has been a decentralization wave on the African continent, whereby local governments are born in, or they have borne increasing responsibilities, especially in public provisions, such as education or water and sanitation and so on. So therefore, local capacity to manage or to minimize um, the mining externalities is therefore crucial to local development. Um, at the same time, on the fiscal federalism literature, um, there is this second generation theory that also points to the fact that intergovernmental fiscal, fiscal arrangements create incentives for local authorities. Therefore, we argue that the way that fiscal arrangements are made between central and um, lower tier government could also have some relevance for how um, those governments actually manage or, or minimize the externalities from mining activities. Therefore, this is what we, we kind of bring it to, to the literature by not just looking at the effects of mining, but also looking at the relevance of local governance and decentralization. So basically what we do, we, we take the the rounds of the Afrobarometer surveys from 2005 to 14, which is approximately more than 130, 130 plus thousand um, respondents, which we linked to the SNL metal and mining database, um, which provides in this time series data on industrial mines, their location and their status. And I think the first speaker is using the same um, data source for, for her research. So in the merging and matching process, then we link the individual survey data from the Afrobarometer to the location of the mines by using the GPS coordinates. So we use the survey years in the Afrobarometer and the year of the latest update on each of the mines. Uh, whenever we have a mismatch, which has been a quite a small number of cases, we then merge with the, with the closed data 
closest data point. For instance, in Senegal, we found three and four. In Burundi, we found five. And Iswatini, we found six. So meaning that we merge the respondents um, data either with the year plus one or year minus one of the latest information on the mine. Um, if the, the geocoded information is not available for the enumeration area in the Afrobarometer survey, then we use the GPS coordinates of the districts or the cities where the respondents are located. So in terms of um, dependent variables, so we look at the self-assessment of quality of uh, public services. It is derived from the question in the Afrobarometer, how well or how badly is your current government handling the following policy matters, like improvement of the living standards, education, job creation, health, water, and sanitation. And then we also created a composite index of public service delivery to capture all these um, different policy areas. And then optimism is derived from the question on how do you expect your living condition to improve in the 12 months after the survey. So we use the distance to the mine. So we adopt what we know as a geographical defensive approach, which has been um, used in, in various other publications looking at the local effects of mining. And for local governance, we constructed a an aggregated measure of measure of effective corruption. And for decentralization, then we use a new indicator which um, measures the level of discretion that subnational governments have over taxes and revenues in, in each given country. And that is, um, this indicator actually has been constructed as part of my PhD dissertation. So, when we look at the appraisal of public services near the mines, both active and inactive, so what we observe is that on average, there is very little satisfaction with how governments are handling public services. For instance, on the left-hand side, we can see improving living standards of the poor, and on the right-hand side, we see job creation. So there is a very high level of dissatisfaction of how governments are handling those services in areas that are close to the mines, um, as we can see on, on these graphs. So when we look at the, the active mines only, we see there is this very high level of dissatisfaction as well. So which makes it um, make sense somehow to investigate actually why is there such a dissatisfaction with public service delivery in, um, in those uh, proximity to mine areas. So as I said earlier, we use this geographic difference in difference estimation technique, which has been using Knudsen and Kotsadam um, paper um, to analyze the relevance of local institutions. Then we interact our measurement of local quality of institutions with the proximity to mine, so active and inactive. And for decentralization, we basically do the same. Um, by interacting the measurement of decentralization of the proximity to the mines. And then we look at the interplay between mining, local governance and decentralization. So first, so at the baseline, we look at the improvement of the living standards of the poor as let's say the perception of how government is doing in that specific policy area. So we notice that um, those that leave the respondents in the Afrobarometer surveys round three to round seven that live close to the mines tend to have a very negative view or negative appraisal of government um, service provision in that particular area. So when we um, then do the, the estimation for the geographic diff and diff, we also notice that those that live close to active mines tend to be less satisfied by approximately 2.3%. Uh, then we do the same with all the type of measurements of um, public service delivery, water, sanitation, jobs, health, um, education, or the aggregate indicator of public service delivery and optimism, and the result tend to, let's say, um, to, to bound in the same direction, meaning that those that live closer to um, an active mines, they tend to be extremely dissatisfied with public service delivery, regardless of, of um, the policy area that, that, we, that we explore. And then we look at the relevance of quality of local institutions using this aggregate indicator of, of bribe incidents at the regional level, or let's say within the boundaries of the local communities of each respondent. And we, we found that actually um, 
the higher, let's say, the poor, the quality of institutions uh, tend to exacerbate the effect of proximity to the minds on the perception of local public services. And that is valid also for different type of measurements of local governance that we use in the paper. Um, when we look at decentralization per se, we found that there is more broadly a negative effect or let's say negative correlations between decentralization and the perception of quality of public services. However, the proximity to mines, so basically the higher the level, the capacity of local government to collect revenues and taxes in areas that are closer to the mine, the higher the probability of those respondents then to have a favorable view of um, the um, delivery of public services in those areas that we explore in the paper. Now, so what we decided to do is to um, have an analysis of interplay. So the interplay means that we take the proximity to the mines and then we look at different scenarios of high and low um, for decentralization and the measurement of local quality of institutions to those four cases scenarios. You have so about what, four minutes left. Okay, thank you. So what we found then when we look at the analysis of the interplay is that the best case scenarios of the four scenarios that we are looking at here, so high uh, bribe incidents, high decentralization, high, low, low, high, and low, low. So we found that the best case scenario is actually when you have very high level of decentralization and very low level of um, let's say, um, incidents of corruption or let's say better quality of institutions. Therefore, we concluded that decentralization might have some benefits, but it only beneficial when you have very low level of corruption. And in all the cases or all the scenarios that we explored, high level of corruption or let's say low level of quality of institutions tend to exacerbate the negative effect of proximity to mines on perceived, per, um, perceived um, quality of public services by the respondents in the Afrobarometer. So in terms of conclusion, we found that there are negative effects of living near to active mines on the perceived quality of public services and on optimisms or let's say your perception about your future um, living standards. We evidence that local institutions actually matter because poor quality of local institutions negatively affects the relationship between mining and service uh, public services. We also um, evidence that decentralization matters because the marginal effects of mining on the perceived quality of public services are positive in countries with high level of decentralization, or let's say in areas with high level of decentralization. However, this positive marginal effect diminishes with poor quality of local institutions. Therefore, the, deser the desirable scenario for resource-rich communities where you have abundant natural resources and also um, natural resources extraction and going might be to have higher level of decentralization and low level of corruption or better quality of local public services, um, better quality of local institutions, sorry. Um, thank you very much. And I look forward to your questions and discussions. Excellent. Thank you very much, Rose, for, for that very interesting presentation. Um, now we have about 20, 25 minutes left, 24 minutes for questions. and. Um, we have a couple in the Q&A already, so please do keep them coming if you have them. And we would want to start with one question by uh, Juliette uh, crispin boucault and uh, she had a question for Melanie. Um, Juliette, if you, I hope you've been uh, admitted to the panel so that you can ask your question live. Yep, here we go. Okay, Juliet. We cannot hear you yet. Not quite. Maybe now. Try try one more time. I'm afraid I can't hear her. Okay, so then I'll, I'll, I'll just read out the question. <laughs> Sorry, Juliet. Um, so uh, Juliet was saying that there's a very interesting paper uh, and asking if there are any effects on fertility, for example, the spacing between children, the ideal number of children, 
or the, of living close to a mine. And um, if you can also do or perform some heterogeneity analysis across countries or within countries, uh, for example, looking at the effect of health related policies and how they could mitigate this. Okay, thank you, Niklas, for reading the question. And uh, thank you, Jeanette, for this very interesting uh, question. So indeed, the effects of um, industrial mining activity on the fertility of cows has also been uh, done by the Benzel and Tolinen uh, paper in the eight countries, uh, where she find no effects on fertility uh, of the women. So actually, for us, as uh, we do not want to use the retrospective questions from the DHS in order to avoid the bias from selective migration, uh, we won't be really able to look at the spacing between children, uh, ideal number of children for each uh, mothers. What we can look at is, uh, for example, the fertility outcomes of the mothers during the five years uh, that precede the, the, the five years of the survey round, uh, where we can have uh, uh, some um, questions uh, on the survey and the uh, in uh, utero exposition. Uh, we can look at uh, occurrence of uh, natality uh, of things like that. Uh, and for the heterogeneity analysis according uh, con countries and counties, uh, of course, uh, in our heterogeneity uh, analysis that is a work in progress, uh, we will look at uh, the effect according to countries according to uh, some uh, health policies uh, related to each country. So of course, it's, uh, it's something that we have in mind. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Now, I also had a question. And uh, let me just encourage the other speakers also to ask questions, obviously, uh, so that we have a bit of a discussion uh, going. In the meantime, I had one question for you, Milani, too, which was, um, We've seen in, I think, Omani's kind of presentation that there's obviously a lot more kind of child related outcomes from the present already. Uh, I'm just wondering if you have looked at stunting, wasting, BMI, fever, diarrhea, any other kind of sicknesses of these instances, and if you could kind of spin a story that is quite congruent with where these mortality rates are, uh, are coming from. Uh, so for now, not yet, we didn't uh, look at uh, some uh, anthropogenic uh, measures from the DHS or something. Uh, it's also work that we have in mind in progress, uh, more to, you know, maybe um, some robustness checks to see if uh, it goes into the same direction as uh, mortality rates. But of course, it's something also that uh, we will look at. Uh, so in uh, utero exposure, um, some uh, long-term <laughs> Uh, effects and uh, anthropogenic uh, measures. Uh, yes, that is something that we will look at from the DHS. Thank you, Niklas, for the question. And do I, and, uh, I just understand your, your results correctly, that you're basically saying there's probably an income effect that's going uh, in favor of the mine, or the, in, that there's economic growth from the mine, which is positive, but then there's like a pollution outcome, especially downstream of that. Um, could you also double check the economic effects from like night lights or built up area or any other kind of more um, objective kind of measures? Yeah, of course, we could look at some uh, wealth index from the DHS also, mm -hmm. just to check, uh, because uh, just to look at the mechanism for the first result based on the geographic treatment where we see a decrease of mortality rates. So yes, we will uh, check that uh, also. So for now, as uh, the results are mainly driven by the immigrant population, we are maybe more um, um, thinking that uh, it's also linked at the uh, selection of the immigration, but that is something also that uh, we'll be able to uh, check whether it's an income effect due to uh, industrial, local industrial development or a uh, selection in the movers that uh, decrease the mortality rates. So that is something also that we look at during the mechanism uh, uh, analysis. Thank you, Nicolas. And, and, and just to double check, the, the in-migrant result hopefully goes away with the downstream upstream in the yes because so, that should be balanced shouldn't it yeah of course so the immigrants are for the upstream uh, downstream uh, so um, as i remember so yes we uh, we didn't have the results for that yet uh, but of course that is also a work in progress that we want to look at whether we still have the selection uh, of immigrants for upstream downstream. but that should go into the same direction so actually, we suggest that it will be the same because when we also uh, um, control for migration, uh, the effect is no longer statistically significant, so it would be the same thing as well. Okay, thank you. No, that's you. super interesting. Um, we had another question from the audience for Oni. So um, 
Damilola had a question. So Damilola, let's try this again. Let's uh, bring her on the panel and please ask your question live if you can. Um, there seems to be like a 50-50 chance that it works. Uh, Damilola, can you, can you uh, unmute yourself? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so uh, my question is, gas flaring in Nigeria, um, is it limited to just the Niger Delta region? Um, if there are other regions experiencing the same thing, um, just thinking it would be interesting to have a kind of comparative study to see if there will be differences in terms of the impact of glass flaring on the health of children. Uh, but then I think that would also be subject to data availability. Yeah, so that, that's just my question. Yeah, thank you for, for the interesting question, Damiola. So given that flaring is associated with uh, oil production and most of the oil production happens in the uh, Niger Delta, uh, most of these locations are in the Delta. So I've actually got an extra slide here of uh, uh, sort of uh, the, the states, uh, the flaring volumes uh, by, by states and the locations in which they, in where they are. We also have some other uh, locations such as uh, Kaduna State, which is the location of a refinery. We also see a bit of flaring there, but because the refinery has intermittent production, so, you know, over a period, maybe we'll see a, a few months where there's some flaring and it's, uh, it's got zero flaring for for most of the time. So most of it are actually uh, located in this state, most of the flaring that we see uh, in this state as well as offshore flaring. So we can see for some states like Anambra, you know, there, there is flaring from 2012 to 2015 and then uh, no, no flaring evidence. So this is uh, uh, closely associated with oil production, which majorly happens in the, in the Delta. Uh, we, we see some spots that are not in this Niger Delta location where we see some um, very sparse flaring that, that happens. But the data is available at a monthly level for all locations. So it's used to es estimate global gas flaring around the world. So this could be extended to any, any sport. It's by latitude and longitude where there is flaring. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, now let me encourage the other speakers to also ask questions to either Melanie or uh, Umoni. Um, in the meantime, I had a very much related question, which was that um, I was wondering to what extent this flaring can be um, uh, switched on and switched off kind of quite flexibly, right? To, to what extent you could just stop the flaring um, due to incentives or due to um, expecting there to be a uh, um, greater backlash, etc. And, and then relatedly, to what extent is like maybe oil price shocks in the world market, does that, uh, is that, is that a good instrument here or, or not? <laughs> yeah, yes. So, so to answer your, your first part of the question, some of it is related to the, to the technology itself. So most times when these wells were initially constructed, um, the gas was seen as a, a wasteful byproduct. So even if you see some of the regulations gu gu guiding uh, oil production in Nigeria was just this thing that we would burn away and nobody cares about it. So infrastructure has not been built to actually collect those gas for, to monetize it, export it. Uh, some of those wells now are reaching the end of their life so cycle. So it's not even worth investing in this collection. So, so in some places, it's, it's not going to be feasible to stop flaring. But for some places, there's also the gas commercialization program, which is actually working towards reducing flaring. So we could see some of those states where flaring has gone to zero, where actually sort of the pilots um, are states that on, onto the gas commercialization uh, project where maybe we build a gas power plant there to, to collect all of the gas and, and use it. Um, in terms of uh, the, the shocks from, from, from oil prices, so there are some other political factors and other things that affect oil production in Nigeria. So even currently now, we're not even able to meet our OPEC quotas because uh, something is not working in the jetty or other factors like that. So there is not a lot of response to, in which I think the response is quite muted to, to changes in the, in the world price. Uh, of, of oil and gas, it's not as if there is excess capacity available, which we can suddenly respond to, 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 to take advantage. 
I see, I see, uh, understood. Um, one, one other uh, clarification question. Did you kind of check if the results from the decreases in flaring, is that symmetric to the effects of the of more flaring? So can you check, like, if you just split the sample into the ones that where it was decreasing and the ones where it's increasing, do you find, like, almost symmetric point estimates? Yeah, so we've not done that. Part of what we want to do with this next stage where we're actually going to look at places where flaring has stopped, so going down to, 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 to the cluster level, to looking at mothers where or children born before and after flaring and looking at states like some that I've shown, which I've had, which you know, ended flaring, quote and unquote, we'll be able to test some of those things that you're suggesting here on to do health outcome improve when, when flaring has stopped. And also another thing which we want to bring into this analysis is location of oil estimates as well. So the same agency, which are oil spill estimates. So the same agency which publishes this data also publishes oil spills. So we could control for some other factor, which we think is also pollution, which might be driving some of these results. Excellent, thank you so much. There was a question from the audience from Agatha, who was wondering where to find the data again. So would you mind maybe just bringing up the slide again? Okay, I, I... yes, I'll, I'll, I'll do that quickly. Um, so it's at um, on the website called gasflaretracker.ng. Can you see my screen? Yeah. So gasflaretracker.ng, so it's got the geographical coordinates. Um, you could overlay it with population data. So it's got quite a few tools that you could play with and you could also download the data in Excel, which gives you uh, the coordinates uh, at the monthly level on, on flare and the flare volume estimates as well. Excellent, thank you very much. I hope that answered Agatha's question too. Now let's move on in the interest of time um, to um, questions for uh, Prudencia. Do we have any from the other speakers while you're still thinking about it? I mean, just raise your hand if you have them or unmute. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just start with my first one, which was you were kind of mentioning, Potentia, why um, the Hansen deforestation data would not be reliable because it's not, uh, if I understood correctly, because it's not just tropical forest. Um, now, there are other, other kind of um, means available, obviously other data sets. There's the vegetation cover indices. There's all these different kind of satellite products. Um, what is your stance on them? And have you kind of double checked or cross checked your results against these more like these satellite products that are tracking greenery or vegetation, for example? Oh, yes, uh, I've uh, looked uh, like recently, I've been working on uh, using other like European um, uh, data sets and um, yeah I, 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 I tried to use like machine learning to actually like try to correct for that but uh, for the most part like everything um, everything that I've seen at least has been cited to having like some errors some measurement errors it's just like really hard to have like satellite data that's like really accurate to that extent yeah there's another paper that i'm more um, i'm using machine learning to kind of like estimate uh, the effect on deforestation but for this one i decided to use um like the producer level data set because I, I mean it's it's more accurate and it kind of like just explains um the mechanism so easily compared to um like using deforestation data. Yeah. Okay. So. Yeah, no, that, that's super helpful because I mean, even if all of them have some Azure, some measure, some measurement error, sorry, um, it may still yeah. be helpful to just, you know, show how they all kind of go in the same direction, although, you know, the point estimates all differ. But talking about the mechanism here, I was wondering, could you just explain one more time what, what is actually happening? So if the if the maize harvest gets kind of ruined by the worms, right, what is then the next kind of move? So do you, there, there's the, the biomass from the maize that is utterly useless then? You cannot use it or, or make use of it? You just need to basically go to the forest and cut some forest? Is that the, the channel? Yeah, that's the channel. Uh, so usually what happens, so when the maize is like really ruined, so you need to have like some income, right? Because these are like smallholder farmers. So like right before, because like the time when I was showing the graph about the timing, so the harvest usually happens like around August. And then the next planting uh, time is like November. So between that time, they have like three months, right? And then the only easiest source, which does not like require a lot of like uh, capital investment other than intensive labor 
is uh, charcoal production. And then charcoal usually, um, it's easy to actually like uh, sell it. Yeah, so it's, it's uh, the best alternative source of income that they have during a production shop. I see, I see. And has there, has there been no kind of policy interventions or initiatives to try to ensure the farmers against the, the, the warm infestation? Yeah, there's been, um, since it's like really new, so they, there's been like some interventions, but much of it has been, uh, has like focused on um, spraying, like um, the immediate like uh, response to it is just like spraying, you know, like offering all this like insecticide. But like there hasn't been like really a deliberate uh, policy, um, like plan on how to actually like really stop the four ones. Yeah. And also no insurance mechanisms once it has happened. No, there's no in, uh, insurance for uh, smallholder farmers uh, in Africa. Yeah, there's uh, been. You know, and I'm aware of that. I, I was more thinking about like the government coming in with like some pro, uh, some public safety net or or some you know employment program or whatever. No, there there hasn't been um, anything that has um, come up yet. Yeah, it's something that they are trying to think about, but uh, so far they haven't like really had any plan on how to actually like really stop this. Yeah, there's been like um, some uh, early warnings that um, there's an organization that's trying to come up with that. I think they've started with, uh, should be Mozambique. I, I can't remember exactly. There's another country that they're working on, but like most of Sub-Saharan Africa do not have like all these like measures on how to actually like Trump and how to actually like survive afterwards. Like if you are hit by four or more. Okay, no, that's super, super exciting because I mean, if you think that climate change is going to make, it's going to make these infestations more likely or these, let's call them agricultural production, production shocks, then uh, maybe governments should start thinking about um, uh, mechanisms to warn the population about it or if, like any early warning systems or have like exposed uh, mechanisms to ensure, ensure people. Very, very interesting. Any other questions for Potencia? Okay, then we uh, can move on to questions for Rose. Let me just check the Q and A. Um, don't see any of them here. If you st still have them, please ask them. I'll kick off one. Um, I was I was wondering a bit. Uh, you you were uh, mentioning that there's a critical distinction between local and central governments and the effect on what like how mining could affect governments differently or how the resource curse could be completely different when seen through the lens from the local uh, uh, in contrast to the central government. Could you just explain maybe one more time for me what, why, why you think that is and which one is the better one? Like which one is the more responsible or sustainable uh, government here? That wasn't obvious to me. Yeah, so thanks for your question. I mean, uh, our idea is not to differentiate the relevance of central versus local government, but rather to um, bring to the debate the relevance of local governments, because in the macro level literature, a lot of like the um, natural resource curse literature have looked at the the relevance of institutions or quality of institutions at the macro level so our argument is that if you have a country let's say you have various mines within the territory probably the quality of institutions at the regional level or at the local level if there is variation from one town to another that could help um, to mitigate the effects of the proximity to mine um, the, the negative effects of, of living close to a mine because local governments, as I've said it during the presentation since the late 1990s, they are more involved in pro, uh, provision of public services through the decentralization waves. So the way that they approach um, mitigating or um, correcting for externalities of mining should actually have a positive or that should play a role in how the, the, the communities that live close to the mines actually perceive um, the effects of the mining activities. So that's the argument. Now, when it comes to the central um, and local government intergovernmental relations, uh, which we try to bring to the table with the, this new measure of, of decentralization. So the rationale behind it is that um, 
in many sub-Saharan African countries, you have um, the polygons or the geographical boundaries of the local communities. And according to the laws on decentralization, local government may or may not have abilities to raise revenues. So even though the royalties from um, natural resources extractions are often managed by central government, the local governments in those communities may have a certain ability to collect revenues and taxes from a activities that are closely related to the mines. Let's say, for instance, after a discovery or after the start um, of, of um, an exploitation of a mine, there could be like other local businesses. Those local businesses might have to pay local property taxes or local patents or local business taxes to those local government, right? So in, in some ways, the ability of local authorities then to benefit not directly from the mining activities because those royalties are often managed by central government, but somewhat indirectly, whether or not they can actually collect revenues in a decentralization system, we think that could also matter because if they manage to collect business revenues from uh, local revenues from businesses for market fees or from um, patents or property or property taxes, um, that are somehow attached to those mining activities, then they might have more revenues to invest in waste management in, in other public services then, which could then have a positive effect on, on how people perceive public services. I so see. we wanted to have both this yeah, quality of variation in quality of local institutions within countries, as well as this um, decentralization parameter which can then play a role in how the mining affects the nearby communities. Okay, thank you very much. I think Melanie also had another question. Melanie? Yes, thank you, uh, Rose, for this uh, very interesting paper. I have very quickly three questions. Uh, the first one, would you try to look also at the status of the mine and, for example, to distinguish between the mines that are national mine versus foreign mine? I know that you have this information in the SNA database and that would be maybe a uh, and for far your argument that you just made. Uh, just some questions. The first, the second one is, uh, why do you focus only on the uh, activity status of the mine and not just maybe on the opening because the uh, opening of the mine might um, trigger a new uh, infrastructure? And the third, <laughs> it's uh, based a little on what I do is, uh, did you uh, think about the selection uh, in, uh, in and out migration to the mining activity that might select people that are maybe uh, more against the local government in favor. Thank you. Yeah, so thanks for your question. Um, so I will start with the second one with regards to the day, opening date of the mines. No, we decided to focus only on the status for now, but we are um, we have an ongoing project where we look at whether the opening of the mine has an effect on how people um, uh, either assess public services or perceive local corruption. So before and after the opening of the mines uh, using the same data set. So that's part of a different project. Um, when it comes to the national versus foreign owned mines, we I mean, it, it probably a bit um, been overly cautious, but we didn't want to have any politically incorrect discourse about, you know, foreign mines versus national mines. So we thought about using that variable, but then in the end we thought, okay, maybe that will bring to too much political debate about, you know, who is the owner of which mine, and we didn't want to dive into this uh, political discussions about mine ownership. I mean, personally, I... I um, yeah, I thought it was probably safe to, to avoid this, this, this analysis. Obviously, I think it, it could have been very useful, um, but we just wanted to prevent like going into the debate about mine ownership, which is at the moment a key issue in sub-Saharan Africa, especially when it comes to industrial mines. Uh, what we've been wanting to do also, we just received a new data set on artisanal mines. So because the SNL database is, basically industrial mines. Uh, this new data set on artisanal mines, which are mostly nationally owned or owned by like local communities or local cooperatives or local association. Um, the idea then it would be to do an extended analysis to see whether um, 
they are more positive association when the mines are owned by the local communities versus when they are owned by, well, versus like industrial mines, which are mostly owned by big corporations or foreign corporations to see if there is any patterns of differences and um, let's say the ownership of the mines by the local community versus the ownership of the mines by um, an external uh, actor. Um, and then, yeah, so I think I answered all your questions. So the first was like national versus foreign and then opening. And then what was the, the third one? Sorry, I may have missed something. Just about selection of uh, in and out migration. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, okay, thank you. Um, so since we are using the, the Afrobarometer survey, we don't really have much questions there on in and out of like migration in each of the rounds of the survey. So we, we were not able to do that, but we have thought about whether, you know, the opening of the mine, I think that some, that is some, somehow related to your third question. The opening of the mine may have brought more um, people to those local communities in search for job opportunities, for instance. But since we don't really have a lot of um, data points on whether you have moved to a different city, or whether you originated from that city, when did you move to that particular city in the Afrobarometer survey, it's difficult to measure um, internal migration as a result of the opening of a, of a mine location in Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we have, uh, we're really short on time. So uh, uh, Omani, if you have a very quick one, then we may have time for that too. Um, yeah, yes, yeah, it, it's a very quick one, which I think Rose has touched about because I wanted to ask both Rose and Melanie if they'd considered artisanal mining because I was looking through one of the figures which was shown for Nigeria, there were basically two mines opened and something that came across my mind was of gaze a lot of more local mines than this and if that could increase, uh, you know, the data points and the closeness to the DHS clusters that you link them to. Okay, I think Rose has literally just answered that. Yeah. Melanie, do you want to come back to? Yeah, of course. So uh, for now, we're just focusing on instrument mining uh, due to the fact that we have a data set on overall Africa. So we know that there is just a working paper that has been just published by uh, Girard uh, and Coder that uh, use a geo geographical, geological endowment to be a proxy for artisanal mining. Actually, maybe we could use that as a robustness, but for now, we don't have that in mind. Uh, why? Because actually, it's hard to know whether when you have an industrial mine, it's because there was artisanal mines before, or on the contrary, that the opening of a new mine attracted new artisanal miners. So, and this is something that is completely different according to the context, and that uh, we maybe uh, need more hand work to do in reading the historic uh, of the mines and for now, no, we do not do that and not to increase the number of points. Uh, and also if there are like completely different uh, impacts on uh, health, uh, as we think that industrial mining might have more um, uh, global effect on the uh, health, whether artisanal mining might have more marginal effects uh, and many on the population that work as artisanal workers. So uh, we have different uh, mechanisms uh, in mind for industrial mining and artisanal mining. So. Thank you very much, Melanie. Um, uh, excellent uh, question. Oh, sorry, Rose, do you want to come back? We, we're no, really short just, on time. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to add it that recently I attended a seminar and there are some data scientists that are attempting to use satellite imagery to look at this issue of industrial versus um, 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 traditional mines. Uh, so they are using satellite data to capture the date of opening of a mine and see whether that's spillovers to having more um, local mines after the opening of a major industrial mines or the other way around. So I don't know whether that project will succeed or not, but there are some attempts to use um, uh, artif um, satellite, uh, satellite imagery to, to come up to some answers related to that.
Okay, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, now that we've brought uh, everybody uh, to the research frontier on uh, artisanal mining and how to detect its effects, um, thank you very much for participating. Thank you very much for the great presentations and all the questions and insightful answers. And uh, I hope to see everybody again for uh, another session of the CSE. For example, this afternoon, there's still a session on infrastructure and spatial integration from 4.30. And without further ado, thank you very much and have a nice afternoon.